Okay, my first official, official. Oh, did I just talk about this one now? I think I did. So this is kind of a dystopian version of a story. A dystopian version of a story. What does that even mean? This is a dystopian story. Womp womp. One, two, A, B, I do it all the time. If you're still with me, I'm impressed. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to another round of most, anti most anticipated books. I filmed this intro about four times, so we're gonna go with this one. Most anticipated books coming out in the month ahead. So we are here to talk about May, which no surprise, there is a huge amount of really great books that are coming out in the next month. And I'm very excited about a lot of them. The first book I have is Meet Me at the Lake by Carly Fortune. So if you guys have followed me for a bit, then you know her debut book, Every Summer After, was one of my favorite books of last year. And it was a book that I didn't even know existed and certainly didn't expect to make my most favorite list. And it completely just pulled me in. I, I just, I cried, I loved it. I was so invested in this book and I'm very excited to see what Carly Fortune does next. So Every Summer After came on my radar thanks to the fabulous Ashley Winstead who was talking about her next thriller, Midnight is the Darkest Hour, which comes out in October. And she said it's like Every Summer After with serial killers. So I was like, oh, Every Summer After must be like some kind of mystery book. And she's like serial killering it. So when I actually looked it up and saw that it was a romance and a second chance romance and dual timelines, I was like, A, how is Ashley Winstead going to turn this into serial killers? And B, one, two, A, B, I do it all the time. I'm going to go read this book immediately. So I went out to my bookstore, bought it immediately and loved it. So here we are with book number two from Carly Fortune, not a series, just her second book. I do have an e-arc of this, which I haven't read yet because I have just been, if you guys have followed me, know struggling with physically reading books as I'm physically editing my own book, but we're gonna get to it because I'm very excited. So in this one, it says, a random connection sends two strangers on a day long adventure where they make a promise one keeps and the other breaks with life changing effects. So in this one, we have Fern and Will, and it says Fern has wasted too much of her adult life thinking about Will Baxter. She, she spent just 24 hours in her early 20s with the aggravatingly attractive, idealistic artist, a chance encounter that spiraled into a day-long adventure in Toronto. The timing was wrong, but their connection was undeniable. They shared every secret, every dream, and made a pact to meet one year later. Fern showed up, Will didn't. So this a thousand percent reminds me of Before Sunrise with Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy, which is one of my Delpy, which is one of my most favorite movies of all time. I am completely obsessed with the Before Sunrise Sunset, um, Before Midnight trilogy. I just, everything about that. And this totally reminds me of that. So I feel like I'm instantly obsessed with this book. So we're meeting Fern at 32 and it says her life is not anything that she imagined it would be. Instead of living in the city, she's back home running her mother's lakeside resort, something she vowed never to do. The place is in disarray, her ex-boyfriend's the manager, and Fern doesn't know where to begin. She needs a plan, a lifeline. And to her surprise, it comes in the form of Will, who arrives nine years too late with a suitcase in tow and an offer to help on his lips. So let's see what happens between the two of them. I assume we're going to get some dual timelines and get to see them in the past and in the present, which is what happened in Every Summer After. And I'm so excited for it. So again, if anyone has seen the before sunrise sunset midnight trilogy maybe you have the same vibes as i do but already i'm like this is ethan hogg and julie delpy meeting in toronto instead of in austria and it's going to be amazing or on a train they meet on a train and then they get off and spend the day together if you haven't seen this movie you're missing out it's amazing the next book is the daydreams and this is by laura hankin so this is a deliciously entertaining novel about the stars of a popular teen show from the early 2000s and the reunion special 13 years after their scandalous flame out that will either be their last chance at redemption or destroy them all for good. So in my mind, I'm picturing, even though it was like a 90s show, like a 90210 style reunion, maybe this could be like a Gossip Girl group reunion, we'll see. But it says back in 2004, the daydreams had it all a cast of innocent seeming teenagers acting and singing their hearts out, amazing ratings, and a will they or won't they romance that steamed up fan fiction forums. Then during the live season two finale, it all imploded, leaving everyone scrambling to understand why. 
Four stars went down very different paths. Kat is a lawyer. Leanna is a bored wife of a famous athlete. Noah, the show's golden boy, emerged unscathed and is poised to become a household name. And Summer, the object of Noah's fictional and maybe real life affections, is the cautionary tale. But fans are demanding a reunion special. The stars all have private reasons to come back, forgiveness, revenge, a second chance with a first love. But as they tentatively rediscover the magic of the original show, old secrets threaten to resurface, including the real reason behind their downfall. Daisy Jones and the Six, anybody? <laughs> will this reunion be a chance to make things right, or will it be the biggest mess the world has ever seen? No matter what, the ratings will be wild. So I remember seeing this Jeez, I don't even know when this came on my radar, but I instantly was just like, yes, yes, please. Thank you. Can't wait. And I'm just very excited for it. So I do love like that reunion feel and like kind of what blew them up in the first place. What's the real story? What's the fact? What's the fiction? I'm definitely coming off a Daisy Jones and the Six Amazon Prime high right now. So I'm definitely craving that feeling. I'm just, my only, I'm like, it's a popular teen show, but they sing and dance and stuff. So I don't know if it's like a Disney club show or I'm not totally sure what the show is, but I'm going to find out either way. So on the list, on the list, on the list. The next book is Love Buzz, a novel by Neely Tubati Alexander. So my favorite Nirvana song is Love Buzz. So when I was reading this and I was like, oh, there's like a Nirvana tie in. It all kind of makes sense. I'm totally interested in this. So this is a chance romantic encounter during a wild night at a Mardi Gras bachelorette party. Send straight laced Serena Khan's carefully constructed life into chaos. I feel like these taglines are always full of words <laughs> that I stumble over. So in this one, it says a wretched maid of honor, a hangover from hell, raucous Mardi Gras crowds. There isn't much Serena Khan is enjoying about this four day New Orleans destination bachelorette party for her semi-estranged cousin, the bride-to-be, until sparks fly with a handsome stranger who, like her, is also from Seattle. After their conversation is cut short, Serena is overwhelmed by the desire to find the charming man with the brooding eyebrows, but her list of clues is pretty short. His name is Julian. He lives on Chamber Hill. He works at a tech company. He loves Little Wayne and Nirvana. The need to find him is for Serena, both irresistible and totally irrational. In a few short weeks, her college alumni magazine is featuring her in a Life at 30 feature, cementing her as a success story. She will have officially achieved the safe, stable life her late mother insisted upon. Julian is not part of the plan. After she combs Seattle for her New Orleans flames, stripping away the perfectly curated life that would have made her mother proud, Serena must decide if the pursuit of a real passion is worth it and fast before she destroys the life she always thought she wanted. So I don't know what about this, like, has me so jazzed other than like all the things about it. So I love the idea of, I think the urban legend of meeting your one true love at a random destination bachelorette party that you don't even want to be at. I think finding out that that one true love happens to be from your hometown area. Wouldn't that be amazing? And I don't know. I just, I love the Nirvana of it all. And I'm always drawn to these characters who are starting over living the life you were meant to live versus living the life you think you should be living. I think having like the strength and bravery to go after what you want. I just love this about these characters. There were some echoes of this in Happy Place by Emily Henry, which I very much enjoyed. And I'm always drawn to that kind of a storyline. So here we go. We'll find out what happens. And of course, I think it was it was last month where I was like, I don't really read romance. And then I gave you guys a whole bunch of romance ones. I think this month is going to be kind of a similar thing. So just be ready for it. Apparently I'm a thriller reader who loves romance. <laughs> who knew? So this is dark romance for you guys. This is The Marriage Act by John Mars. So I did mention this earlier in the year because this came out in the UK, I want to say January, February. So this is the second time I'm talking about it. I'll do a very brief overview in case you guys missed that one, but it is coming out in the US now. So in case you guys are waiting for it here. So this one is What If Marriage Was The Law? Dare You Disobey? So I'm a big fan of John Mars. I loved the one that was the first book of his that I read. He takes some very interesting twists and turns on topics that I very much enjoy. He loves darkness, which I very much enjoy. And I'm always very curious. So this is kind of a dystopian version 
of a story, a dystopian version of a story. What does that even mean? This is a dystopian story. So it says Britain, the near future, a right wing government believes it has the answer to society's ills, the sanctity of marriage act, which actively encourages marriage as the norm, punishing those who choose to remain single. But four couples are about to discover just how impossible relationships can be when the government is monitoring every aspect of our personal lives, monitoring every word, every minor disagreement, and will use every tool in its arsenal to ensure everyone will love, honor, and obey. This feels like all kinds of creepy to me. And like, what would you do? What would you do if the government dictated that you have to be married? And like, what happens to the people who are single? just is very interesting to me. So it says that it lives in the same universe as the one. I don't know much about this book other than what I just read to you guys. I have heard some good things about it and very dark and twisted and all of that good stuff. So I debated pre-ordering it. The whole book depository thing like threw me sideways, but I am in the process of test driving Blackwells for my UK books because I will not be denied. And I haven't read a John Mars book in a couple of years, I feel like, which I'm, I feel like a shame spiral admitting that to you guys, because I'm like, he's one of my favorite authors, which he is. And then I've done a terrible job of reading a bunch of his books. So this one intrigues me. Dark romance is what we're going to attempt to call this one. And I'm going to read it at some point. I'm excited for it. I'm definitely excited for it. Okay, my first official pre-order for the May books. This is The Boyfriend Candidate by Ashley Winstead. I feel like I need to say nothing. I'm obsessed with Ashley Winstead. I love her rom-coms. I love her thrillers. I'm totally here for this book. This does take place in the same universe as Fool Me Once. This is a companion novel and it follows, so our main character in Fool Me Once was Lee Stone. This book follows her younger sister, Alexis. So this one is pitched as a laugh out loud rom-com about learning to embrace living outside your comfort zone. So Alexis is a, shy, is a shy school librarian. The tickle in my throat is real. And she is comfortable staying out of the spotlight. But when she's dumped for being too meek in bed, the humiliation is a wake up call. She decides she needs a change and what better way to kick off her new more adventurous life than with her first one night stand, which she has with Logan. This is one of my favorite names for a character. So it says, enter Logan, the gorgeous foul mouthed stranger she meets at a hotel bar. He's audacious and filterless, making him Alexis's opposite. And boy, do opposites attract. Just as she's about to fulfill her hookup wish, the hotel catches fire in a freak lightning storm. And in their rush to escape, Logan is discovered carrying her into the street where people are waiting with cameras. Cameras Logan promptly and shockingly flees. Alexis is bewildered until breaking news hits. Pictures of her and Logan escaping the fire are all over the internet. And it turns out that Logan is none other than Logan Arthur, the hotshot politician challenging the Texas governor's seat. The salacious images are poised to sink his career and jeopardize Alexis's job until a solution is proposed to squash the scandal. He and Alexis could pretend to be in a relationship until election day in two months. What could possibly go wrong? So fake dating all around. This definitely reminds me of get a life. No. Take a hint, Danny Brown. I was like, wait, it took me a minute by Talia Hibbert, which is my favorite of her Brown sisters books. So I'm very intrigued. I was obsessed with Fool Me Once. I laughed so much. I totally loved it. It was steamy. It was funny. It was smart. And I'm very interested to see what Ashley Winstead does next. I'm secretly hoping we get a little bit of Lee in that book as well. And I'm just very, very ready for this one to come out. So again, I will be chomping at the bit for my pre-order to show up at my door and I'm going to read it immediately. So very excited. Mark your calendars. She can do no wrong. She can do no wrong. The next book I have is called No One Needs to Know, and this is by Lindsay Cameron. So this is when an anonymous neighborhood forum gets hacked. The darkest secrets of New York's wealthiest residents come to light, including some worth killing for. Ah, uh, it was all confidential right up until the moment it wasn't. So there's a website called Urban Myth, and it was lauded as an alternative to the performative Show Your Best Self platforms, an anonymous discussion board grouped by zip code. So in this one, we have the residents of Manhattan's Upper East Side. I love rich people behaving badly so, 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 so much. 
then they have disclosed it all, things they would never share with their friends or their spouses, secret bank accounts, steamy affairs, tidbits of juicy gossip. These are the same parents who would go to astonishing lengths to ensure their children gain admission to the most prestigious boarding schools and universities. So when a hacktivist group breaks into the forum and exposes the real identity behind each poster, the repercussions resound down Park Avenue with a force none could have anticipated. And somebody will end up dead. I'm totally over this. I, I don't know why. I live for rich people behaving badly books. I really, really do. Give me some Upper East Side any day of the week. This one just sounds so fun. It's like all the salacious stuff that I firmly believe actually exists on the Upper East Side. And we're going to pull back the curtain and read all about it. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. So uh, I don't know. I feel like it's been a minute since I've read like a very dishy, delicious kind of book like this. It kind of reminds me a bit of May Cobb. And I'm just so ready for it. And even... um. Geneva Rose's One of Us is Dead, like that same kind of vibe of it all. I'm just very excited, as you can probably tell. <laughs> this will be a first book by Lindsay Cameron for me, but I'm psyched for it. Love finding somebody new. Okay, the next book is Major Writer Vibes, you guys, and this is Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong. So it says, what's the harm in a pseudonym? New York Times bestselling sensation Juniper Song is not who she says she is. She didn't write the book she claimed she wrote, and she is most certainly not Asian American. So this is pitched as a chilling and hilarious cutting novel in the vein of White Ivy and, uh, and the Other Black Girl. Two books I read and two books I very much loved. So in this one, it says authors June Hayward and Athena Liu were supposed to be the twin rising stars. Same year at Yale, same debut year in publishing. But Athena's a cross-genre literary darling, and June didn't even get a paperback release. Nobody wants stories about basic white girls, June thinks. So when June witnesses Athena's death in a freak accident, she acts on impulse. She steals Athena's just finished masterpiece, an experimental novel about the unsung contributions of Chinese laborers to the British and the French war efforts during World War I. So what if June edits Athena's novel and sends it to her agent as her own work? So what if she lets her new publisher rebrand her as Juniper Song, complete with an ambiguously ethnic author photo? Doesn't this piece of history deserve to be told whoever the teller? That's what June claims, and the New York Times bestseller list seems to agree. But June can't get out of Athena's shadow, and emerging evidence threatens to bring June's stolen success down around her. As June races to protect her secret, she discovers exactly how far she will go to keep what she thinks she deserves. So clearly a scathing look at the publishing industry, and it says it takes on questions of diversity, racism, and cultural appropriation, not only in publishing, but the persistent erasure of Asian American voices and history by Western white society. So I am super curious about this. It definitely reminds me a little bit of the plot by Jean Han of Korolitz, which I haven't read yet, but I know it's about people stealing each other's manuscripts. And then Kill Your Darlings by David Bell, which I did read, which is about a professor stealing one of his student manuscripts. This book obviously shines a light, like I said, also on diversity and racism, and I think it's just gonna be really interesting. So I have not yet read an R.F. Kwong book. I do have Babel, which I've been really afraid of really big books lately. It's somewhere down low because it's really big. Um, but I do appreciate that she writes such different books. I know she wrote The Poppy War also, which fantasy, a little bit out of my realm, but I've heard amazing things about it. So I'm really interested about this. You guys know I love a book about writers. Very curious about the publishing industry side of it. I very much enjoyed The Other Black Girl, so I'm curious. I will be reading this. And it's getting great early reviews also. Okay, I swear I didn't plan this. I am just talking about them in the order that they come out. But another book about writers. This is I Didn't Do It by Jamie Lynn Hendricks. So I have the e-arc of this, which I have been saving till it's a little bit closer to pub day, and I'm very excited to read it. This is about a murder at a suspense writer conference, and it makes everyone a suspect, especially the victim's literary rivals. So the name of the conference is called Murder Palooza. It's the premier thriller writer conference, and it's meant to be an exciting celebration of the genre and its preeminent writers. So I feel like this is definitely Thriller Fest meets BoucherCon. And I actually did a writing class with Jamie Lee Hendricks through Writer's Digest last month. It was in March, so depending on when you guys see this. And I'm such a huge fan of her. I really enjoy her as a writer. Her class was absolutely amazing, and she was obviously talking about this book. And as someone who goes to writing conferences, I'm very excited for this. 
So like I said, we have somebody who dies at this and everybody's a suspect. So best-selling author and industry favorite, Kirsten Bailey, is found dead in her home, Kristen. I grew up with Simon and Kirsten and I always see Kirsten and not Kristen. Okay. Best-selling author and industry favorite, Kristen Bailey, is found dead in her hotel room. And four rival authors, a mid-lister, an egomaniac, a has-been, and a newbie, also get targeted by an anonymous social media account and wonder if they're next. First, they find themselves bonding to try and find out who's behind it. And as the account taunts them, it slowly reveals secrets that each of them have connected to Kristen. Secrets that make them all a suspect in each other's eyes. Soon they're turning on each other and silently accusing each as a killer. Time is running out until the awards ceremony where the social media account has promised a big reveal. The only thing they know for sure is that no one is better at both creating and solving a mystery than the people who write them for a living. So we're getting a sneak peek into the thriller writing world and those who inhabit it. I really enjoy her. I really, 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 really do. So I read, it could be anyone, US title, her husband's murder, UK title. I read the UK title and I loved it. So I do have her first book, Finding Tessa, US title. It's so confusing. His missing wife, UK title, which I was going to dive into, but then I got the arc of this. So I think I'm going to read this one first. So like I said, I'm a huge fan of hers. I am a thriller writer. I have been to thriller writer conferences. I'm very excited to see her bring the thriller writer conference to life, especially because I think even though I haven't met her. I think we have crossed paths at a thriller fest in the past. So very excited for this one. I think it's just going to be amazing. She writes such great characters. I very much enjoy her dark and messed up in this in her stories. She's another one that goes all in. And I also feel like there's going to be like a good wink and a nod of the behind the scenes of thriller life. So a huge fan. Okay, next up is The Chateau. And this is by Jacqueline Goldis. So this is one that I just kind of stumbled upon. And I'm super intrigued. It is it is giving me the buzzwords for fans of Lucy Foley, Ruth Ware, and Lisa Jewell. This is very much like Tell Me No More I'm absolutely interested in, but let's talk a little bit more. So this is a dream girl's trip to a luxurious French chateau, and it devolves into a deadly nightmare of secrets and murder. Yes, please. Yes, please. I can see the comparisons. So welcome to picturesque Provence, where the lady of the chateau, Seraphine, I'm not going to attempt her last name because it's uber French, has opened its elegant doors to her granddaughter Darcy and the three friends. 20 years earlier, the four girls studied abroad together in France and visited the old woman on the weekends, creating the group's deep bond. But why this sudden invitation? Amid winery tours, market visits, and fancy dinners overlooking olive groves and lavender fields, it becomes clear that each woman has a hidden reason for accepting the invitation. Then, after a wild evening celebration... Seraphine is found brutally murdered. Dun, dun, dun. As the women search for answers, that was way too dramatic, sorry. As the women search for answers to this shocking crime, fingers begin pointing and a sinister Instagram account pops up, exposing snapshots from the friend's intimate moments at the chateau while threatening to reveal more. Hmm. I feel like there's a typo in this description. As they race to uncover who murdered Seraphine and who is stalking them, they learn the chateau houses many secrets, several worth killing for. So yes, 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 yes. I love an isolated mystery. I love a maybe hopefully dark and twisted female friendship. I do love the complications of female friendships. Um, I, I'm down with some, some stuff in France. I feel like it's been a minute since I have read a book about France and I hope someday to go back. So <laughs> just, so I'm expecting some drama. I'm wondering why Darcy's grandmother is dead. I wonder why anybody would want to kill her. Why is everybody back? It definitely rings Lucy, Lucy Foley, Ruth Ware, Lisa Jewell, three of my favorite authors. So I'm, yeah, I'm here. I am here for this book. And then another one that is super anticipated. I mean, like the whole list is, but like... Some are always a little bit more than others. This one is Bad Summer People. This is by Emma Rosenblum. So this is a debut and it says it's about infidelity, backstabbing, and murderous intrigue set against an exclusive summer haven on Fire Island. So in this one, it says none of them would claim to be a particularly good person, but who among them is actually capable of murder? So in this one, it says Jen and Lauren rule the town of Salcombe Fire Island every summer. They hold sway on the beach and the tennis court and are adept at manipulating people to get what they want. Their husbands, Sam and Jason, have summered together on the island since childhood, despite lifelong grudges and numerous secrets. Their one single friend, Rachel Wolf, is looking to meet her match, 
whether he's the tennis pro or someone else's husband. Womp womp. But even with plenty to gossip about, this season starts out as quietly as any other, until a body is discovered face down off the side of the boardwalk. So stylish, subversive, darkly comedic, it's a story of what's lurking under the surface of picture-perfect lives in a place where everyone has something to hide. So I don't know if they are rich people behaving badly or if they are just people behaving badly, but I'm really excited to this. Excited to this. I'm excited for this. So I think it has a little bit of a Hunting Wives vibe I'm seeing from somebody's review. I'm like, I always look at reviews like through one closed eye here, but I just, I said this earlier in today's video, I've been missing kind of that May Cobb, rich people behaving badly vibe. So kind of like the Upper East Side book, this is definitely giving me sort of dark and messed up New Yorkers at their finest. And I'm always down for that. So on the list. And then we have The Night in Question. This is by Kathleen Glasgow and Liz Lawson. This is the second book in the Agatha series. I believe this is the only YA book I have on this list. So this is YA mystery. I read the Agathas last summer when it came out. I totally enjoyed it. And I'm super excited because I just recently got approved for an e-arc of this on NetGalley, which I'm very excited for. So in this one, it says, how do you solve a murder? And this is very similar to the first book. So I'm not going to tell you guys what happened in the first book. I'm going to keep this super brief. So it says, how do you solve a murder? Follow the lessons of the master, Agatha Christie. So Iris and Alice were, became friends in the first book. So Iris wound up tutoring Alice. There was a girl in their town who went missing and they started to look into the mystery in the first book and they became friends through doing that. So in this one, they find themselves in the middle of another mystery. So the town in this is called Castle Cove. I originally thought that was a wink and a nod to Murder, She Wrote, which is Cabot Cove, but somebody in one of the seasons, I don't know if it's like season three or four, writes a fictional story about Cabot Cove and the town is called Castle Cove. If you're still with me, I'm impressed, but it's actually from something else. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> just, it just made me love it more. I was like, oh my God, there's Agatha Christie, there's Murder, She Wrote, which mind you, total sidebar, there is a Murder, She Wrote element to happy place by emily henry which i absolutely loved and i totally forgot to talk about it in my book review of it but i just any any anytime anybody can work that into a story i'm here for it so in this one they worked on a case in the past and let's see what i can say about anything without giving anything away okay so in this one we have a school dance at the infamous Levy Castle, the site of a film starlet, Mona Moody's unsolved death back in the 1940s. So we have something that happens in the present. So it says to understand the present, sometimes you need to look to the past. And that's exactly what Iris and Alice are going to have to do if they want to solve their new case. So it says only what they uncover might very well kill them. Because of course, it's a thriller. So I really enjoyed the first book. I love the dynamic between the girls. It's definitely of that same vein of kind of a truly devious, not quite as dark as Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I would say it's definitely a little bit lighter, but still very engaging. Maybe kind of like a, where's the Kit Frick book? Dang, I can't see the book. Like a Who Killed Zoe Spanos, like something along those lines. So I'm super invested. I am very excited when I saw there was a sequel to this and I'm definitely down for it. I love it. I love it. So that is gonna do it for my list for May. I know there's so many more books. You guys know the assignment. What book are you most excited about in May? What book have you already maybe had a chance to read that is coming out? What is just got your eye and your ear and everything in between? I'm just so excited. I can't keep up with all of the amazing new books. I'm very much struggling. I feel like I have met, read more new releases this year than I have in past years. I feel like I should do the math on that also. I don't know, there's just so many freaking amazing books. I can't control myself. So that is it for today. I feel like the allergy season is completely messing with my head. I definitely have brain fog, but that's gonna do it for today's video. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you made it this far, <laughs> you're amazing. And I'm so grateful you guys are here. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for being here. I hope you guys are doing great and I'll see you in another video really soon. I need some water. All right, take care guys, bye.